Support the channel on patreon.com slash manlightfoot. Hey everybody, I'm just popping in to tell you that the video you're about to watch is just a compilation of three previous videos that I made on the Owl House. There are three video essays where I go in depth about the deeper meanings behind the series and what the characters are going through, breaking down how this amazing show broke past the normal fantasy tropes that we're all used to seeing and pushing boundaries in a way that made it a strong staple that people are going to sing its praises for a while now. Some of you have probably watched these already, but what's wrong with watching something again just for nostalgia's sake, you know? Even though they're not that old. Though I did add a bit more to the final video for this version, so it's an exclusive extended version for y'all to enjoy. Don't say I don't ever do anything nice for anybody. Now before we start things off in the land of the boiling isles, let's take a trip to the land of Teleraria with today's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. Raid is this unique mobile game that's also made its way over to PC, so now you can keep the fun going even on your home computer. It sports high quality graphics that just pop as you decimate your enemies into oblivion. You can even take your Reign of Terror online in the PvP arena and show other players around the world why they should fear even the whispers of your name. There's such a wide variety of characters to choose with a selection of 700 unique champions, all with their own unique strategies you can utilize to win challenges, dungeons, boss fights, and even more. With it being a game that's always updating, I'm never running low on stuff to do, or heathens that I want to make cry. I don't have a problem. Be sure when you get in the game to complete all the tutorials to maximize your experience. You can even get more into the lore of Raid with the new limited series Raid Call of the Arbiter. It goes more in depth about the characters and their background so you can get your fix of story for all you lore heads. Some of the characters are even being added as champions to the game. The first one being Artek the Mighty Warlord Orc. What's awesome is that he's going to be free to play for everyone. Just log in to Raid for 7 days between now and July 24th. You're definitely going to want this guy if you've seen Call of the Arbiter. And if you haven't, well finish this video and pop on over and watch it, come on now. For any new players, use my link in the description or scan the QR code right here and you'll get a free starter pack with this nice in-game loot. Just hit that link in the description, beat the tutorial, and I'll see you on the battlefield. Thanks to Raid for sponsoring this video, and now on with the show. We're in an interesting time with cartoons right now. We've been getting some great stuff that kind of plays a bit against our expectations. Shows that can be more experimental with their animation, or their characters, or do whatever the hell Neo Yokio was supposed to be doing. There's just been a great assortment of cartoons that go beyond the pale of what's expected out of traditional storytelling. But there's one more recent show in particular that I believe breaks everyone's expectations, and that being The Owl House. Now when we first got wind of this show when it was announced back in 2018, we thought it would would just be something far different than what we'd expected with its mentions of having horror elements, especially for a Disney property. The first season came and ended up being pretty good, but I can admit it didn't exactly live up to those horror elements. Now of course you don't blame the crew for that matter, but you more blame the head honchos. Whore. But that's neither here nor there. The first season was still able to get people invested in it by having these interesting characters that had their own arcs to them. But there still was the feeling that it was treading familiar territory. You know, family drama between siblings, magic schools, high school romances, evil pig creatures shrinking you and your friends down and using you for a circus act. It's all familiar ground we've seen a dozen times. What? But by the end of season one, things start to change. We got the indication that the show is going to take a bit of a turn for the next season, and with season two halfway over, we definitely got some turns. Boy, did we get some turns. Throughout this season, we've been getting nothing but development after development, which is pretty unique for a lot of Western cartoons. Usually there are a few buffer episodes between major developments in the story or characters, but each episode has been constantly building upon each one, a lot of them going against what was expected in these fantasy shows and putting us in a new state of awareness for the series. So that's ultimately something I wanted to talk about. I do want to preface that the current season isn't finished and there's still a third season on the way so stuff can change later with any new revelations so just keep that in mind in the timing of this video. I should also mention that there is very much going to be spoilers for season 2 all throughout this video so if you haven't watched it by now don't watch this video unless you're okay with spoilers. Just putting that out there. Now am I just making this because the second season has been so jam packed with new shit that I want to ease the load for the eventual second thoughts that I'll make at the end of the season? Maybe. But either way, I genuinely believe this show breaks our preconceptions of what to expect from fantasy stories. I think there's a lot to be looked at with how this series breaks the fantasy. Alright, every great sports story includes a training montage. Shut up. 
Now, this show definitely goes beyond your preconceptions with its characters. One character who definitely went beyond what we thought was Lilith. Now, it has more to do with where we thought the show was gonna go with her. I mean, with the end of season one, we saw her split the curse with Ida as a means to make up for cursing her, as well as almost getting her turned to stone and trying to kill her student. Why are you the way that you are? Listen, we've all thought about harming a teenager or two. Pobody's nerfing. Anyway, what we thought we were gonna get with her was a long redemption arc. Could have involved a lot of long, drawn out moping and feeling guilty about what happened that a lot of stories would go with, but instead it moves subtly past that old song and dance. Plus, she turns out to just be a total goober. I mean, look at her. Vomit. <laughs> Watching the ink dry is the best part. Isn't she just marvelous? We do get her feeling guilty, but it doesn't linger unnecessarily, because simply put, you already know what would happen afterwards. The interesting thing with her is the fact that nobody stays upset with her and lets her into the group with open arms. It's a change of pace and doesn't feel contrived or rushed because she basically already did what she could do to make up for it by splitting the curse, which I should remind you turns you into this thing. But speaking of the curse, there's one person who's had to deal with it the most. No, you stupid dicks. I'm talking about Ida. She sort of flips a lot of the fantasy tropes on their head. For one thing, usually the mentor dies with little to no real development to them. With Ida, there's actually a lot of development to her. With her curse, we find out it actually can count as an allegory to having a mental disability. Now, Leia from Toon Ruins lays out the point perfectly in her video, so I recommend watching that for a better in-depth look. But basically, we see that Ida's curse is something that she can't exactly make go away, but instead has to manage it like a mental disability. Now, being someone with ADHD, I completely get the parallel. But it goes further beyond that with how she hates having the curse, but understands that it's a part of her and eventually learns to control it. Listen, neither of us want to be here, but we are, and there's no changing that. If we can't accept each other, this nightmare will never end. So what do you say? Truce? For now? <laughs> oh, that's hot. That's hot. We saw the negative effects it had on her life by making it drive her family and even her lover Rain away. All because she just wouldn't let her pride go and accept help. It was subtly hinted at in The Intruder back in Season 1 when it was revealed that she never even told King about the curse. But her letting people in is what got her to actually find the positive side to her disability. I mean, let's not forget who he helped her finally face the beast within and gain her new form. Oh, well, Hootie, you actually weirdly helped me. I'm like a harpy woman now. Yeah, you are. Okay, the thirsting stops there, I promise. Okay, one last one. You're hot! Moving on. Ida herself actually plays against expectations with how she learned to accept help from others. Her connection to Luz brought about every piece of change that was a betterment to her life. You helped me find King's Crown when you barely knew me. You saved me from turning to stone and you even got me talking to my sister again. So, unfortunately for you, my life is pretty great because I'm friends with Luz the Human. You think about it, that's what's unexpected with the student being the biggest reason for the master still being alive. Without Luz, Ida would have eventually got captured and turned to stone because no one would have been able to help her. This even affects how Ida acts. Instead of pushing people away and just being a loner type, she starts caring for others even to a point that it's sort of motherly. Say that again and I steal your tongue. All right, Jesus. We see this further proved when she was close to letting herself die for a rebellion only to be stopped when it came into question about King and Luz. She became soft once she gained responsibility all for the better. She was a loner, but she sees that there's value in family. Is that what you wanted to tell me this whole time? And if you sign here, it'll be official. Ida, uh, uh, are you okay? You big old softy. 
Our expectations are even played when it comes to King. Of course, we all thought he was just some cute little demon with delusions of grandeur who's basically just the mascot of the group, but we managed to get something more. Don't get me wrong, he is very much a cute demon with delusions of grandeur, but he's also someone that possibly holds a lot of significance. Now again, the season's not over, and I don't know exactly what we're gonna find out about him in terms of his lineage later on, so that's still up in the air, but I do know we found some strong emotional core to him. A lot of mascot characters in fantasy don't really have much going on, but we get good moments of King either feeling guilty for his actions or questioning himself. Everyone lied! And I was too caught up in the fantasy to realize it? I don't, I don't know what to do, Luce. I can't tell what's real and what's fake. He pushes past that trope of the cute mascot and has actual depth that you wouldn't expect him to have. Hell, I wrongfully expected him to be the son of the Titan, but if you look at the Titan, it looks nothing like him. You dumb motherfucker. Excuse me for getting invested. There's also Hootie who, let's face it, everyone hated at the beginning, but turned everything around by being pretty integral for major developments with the characters, be it King's powerful scream, Edith's harpy form, or hell, Luz and Amity getting together. He managed to go beyond what anyone thought he was going to be for the show. In fact, it's pretty interesting with how they have these developments in the same episode, and it doesn't feel rushed. Everyone's developments all work within a short story format that comes together by the end. Everything feels like it got its natural progression, which works much better than having them all be in separate episodes that would have just taken up time. It just shows that the show can play to a different tune even in the formatting. But anywho, there are certain new characters that play against the fantasy of what the audience was expecting, like most notably Ida and Lilith's mom Gwendolyn. Most of us definitely were expecting her to be super neglectful to her children, maybe to a point she couldn't even bring herself to hug her children. I mean, come on, why else would Ida not know what a hug is? But we found out with her that she is an overbearing mother that means the best but is clearly misguided in her effort. She sees Ida's curse as something that needs to be eliminated, rather than something that should be managed. She gets help from bullshit alternative medicine gurus, which side note, if you listen to alternative medicine gurus, you're an idiot. I don't make the rules, I digress. With that revelation about her, we see it did negatively affect her relationship with her daughters. So much that it drove Ida away from her and she neglected her other daughter, Lilith, just to help her out with the curse. We expected she'd be too far gone and Ida would just kick her out of her life, but no. Gwendolyn takes it upon herself to actually correct her mistakes and even realizes she was just being taken advantage of by the guru. Ida told me she found something that made it manageable at least, but I did Listen. I could give you the next volume. Five percent off. Ten percent off. Leave. And if I ever see you in Bonesboro again, every beast in the forest will be after your head. Let's say that again. I couldn't hear you over the sound of me shitting myself. Yeah, I would not fuck with Mama over there, especially not with those gains. We got Gwen making up with her daughter, even having Lilith go with her back home to make up for lost time. Of course we thought Lilith was going to be a permanent member of the Owl House, but that's what I mean when I say this show plays against the fantasy. Now I know you're all probably thinking, what about Lucy and Amity in the romance? Listen, you can't just jump into it. You gotta ease into these things. Set the tone. The transitions into romance gotta be smooth. <laughs> you're about as smooth as a dirt road. Hate it here. Everything is so crazy right now, and I have no idea what my future holds, but it would be so cool if you were in it. May I have this dance? Now we bring things to the biggest heavy hitters in the series with Loose and Amity. Am I only bringing up Loose and Amity now so I wouldn't have to talk about them multiple times? Maybe. But don't worry about that. A big thing of note that's subversive about these two is how they basically got together. 
With Luce and Amity, they were given plenty of time to develop their feelings towards one another. Of course, they had a bit of familiar ground with some misunderstandings and mishaps, but they are pretty unique with the enemy to friends to lovers angle. It just has a natural progression that you don't often see in cartoons. Most relationships in animation have the main character and their love interest get together by the end of the series, and even then, it's just through a kiss. For Lumity, or to some Lucity, gross. They get together midway through the second season, and even then, it's just in a more relatable sense. Well, it's about as relatable as your crush getting eaten and digested and delivered to your basement by your house demon to confess through a tunnel of love can be. So what? It happens. Anyway, it's not really done in the most flashy way. Luz and Amity just ask each other out, which plays against the flashiness, kind of breaking the idea of the confession needing to be this extravagant display when your significant other is okay with something simple. Though in Amity's case, she was feeling some of that mushy shit. Little Miss Thang over there. The romance is different by not having anything hinge on it. Don't get me wrong, Lucy and especially Amity gained some development through this relationship, which I'll get more into in a minute, but the show is clever not to have their love be the crux of the main story. If Lucy and Amity were to just be friends, it wouldn't hurt the story. It's pretty refreshing to get a love story that doesn't use the love conquers all trope. It's just the simple teenage nerves that get in the way for them. Nothing in terms of overbearing parents, to a degree, or anything that fantastical. I enjoy the more semi-relaxed take the show uses. I'm a romantic, I like variety. Sue me. With Luce and Amity, their love is more a crux for their own development, but it doesn't do too much of what you think it would do. For instance, you would think they would have melodrama between Amity and Luce like when Amity starts doubting herself because she thinks Luce would break up with her for failing the mission at Eclipse Lake, but she gets her confirmation that's not the case from Luce herself, showing that she just cared about her girlfriend's safety. There's still more to be seen from the season, but that bit of familiar angst is put to bed early on. It's kind of nice to leave things open for other parts of their relationship. For all we know, we might get Amity having to step up and support Luce when she's feeling insecure. We never really got to know how much she didn't fit in back on Earth, and we saw a bit of her worrying about people making fun of her when she was scared of Amity not liking her for being cheesy. So maybe we could get a bit of glimpse into that for them. I don't know, that's just something I'm hoping we see. A thing I noticed for this couple was how the two became better people before they actually entered their relationship. Normally that's not often the case. Usually the characters just hop into the relationship and then they get better from being with each other. But it's reversed here. Amity, for instance, started out pretty angry and frustrated and thought she needed to be Miss Perfect. Aww, it's like mine. But much smaller and meaningless. As top student, it's my duty to tell you to keep at it. Even you could get a passing grade someday. Nerd! But she ends up learning to be a better person and finds the true friend group she needed before she dates Luz. The same thing happens with Luz with her learning to take charge and correct her mistakes on her own, especially when she got Amity fired from her job before she dates her. It's a nice switch up on character betterment for a relationship. Speaking individually of these two, they both play against what you would expect. With Amity, there's a personality change that goes with her new look. Usually characters that get an update to their look, you can see a semblance of that old person. But with Amity, the way she looks now wouldn't fit with how she was in the past, and vice versa. Green-haired Amity wouldn't fit right if she acted like lavender-haired Amity. Seriously, look at these two. You can't say they're the same. Lavender hair Amity is more nice and accepting of who she is as well as others. She doesn't feel she needs someone else's approval, unlike green haired Amity. So all those bald headed or nappy headed hoes doubting her new cut can sit down. I like your cut, G. A nice thing that I think is a good change of pace is how Amity disregards her dream of joining the Emperor's Coven. We saw in Covention it was her dream and how crushed she was when she got embarrassed in front of them. But an honestly cool detail with her is that she moves on from it without any episodes showing her struggle with it. Yep, she ends up helping Luce and the gang against the Coven in Eclipse Lake no problem. You're left to infer that since she got betrayed by the Coven when Lilith was her mentor, that that was enough for her to see the Emperor's Coven ain't shit. Added on with the fact that her crush faced off against the Emperor, so she's just like fuck it and chose Luz's side. It just kinda lets the audience put two and two together without needing to hold their hands, which is pretty refreshing. Now with Luz, she basically embodies not really knowing what you want. With a lot of main characters in animation, they have some long-term goal in mind, but for Luz, she's not sure what she wants. 
She wants to be a witch, but that's way too vague. I want to be a witch. You stupid. She also wants to get back to her mom, but that's more short term. It leaves you guessing what her big goal is gonna be. It's a different way for them to get you invested into a main character. Also, a specific take for Luz I find unique is that Luz isn't exactly a pushover. Even though she's in a foreign land, she never lets anyone take advantage of her. A lot of characters that fall into the Isekai trope usually have a thing of being special. Like it's predestined or they're just really good at almost everything. But for Luz, she's not special and really does have to adapt to her new freaky environment. I'm a bad boy. Sure, Jan. Amphibia also plays to this idea as well, but that's a topic for another day. But I do enjoy that Luz relies more on her own skills and instincts to get through whatever situation she's in. The show even says it themselves in the second episode of season one, saying she just has to make her own destiny. Everyone wants to believe they're chosen. But if we all waited around for a prophecy to make us special, we'd die waiting. And that's why you need to choose yourself. Does that mean you'll give me a magic staff of my own? Not yet, but someday. They even avoid the trope of the important parent for Luz. Could have easily made her dad like a wizard that had a secret life, but they don't bother with it. It flips things on its head to let you know it's not that type of story. Luz and Amity are a pretty unique couple. Normally with couples in animation, you find yourself losing interest in them after they get together because you're not going to see too much new in terms of development. But with Lumity, there's nothing but potential. They both haven't dated anyone before, so this is all new territory for them, which gets you more invested in wanting to see how they grow from this relationship. You can genuinely see the relationship grow from its infancy. It's just amazing how these major characters can flip the fantasy you were expecting on its head. But you might be thinking, Thinking, what about all the other people the series introduced, or even the world itself? No, no or not. Well, you're gonna find out about them anyway, you assholes. Our family is gone because of wild magic. You yeah. better back the heck down. We have to focus on what's best for our family. Turn a beat up. The show makes a concerted effort to not just rely on the main cast for its subversions. There are certain characters and even the world that plays around with what you were expecting. But I should say we don't have a lot to go off of since some characters just got introduced this first half of the season or more or less didn't actually get proper screen time. So there's still more to discover for some of these characters. That being said, main antagonist Emperor Bellos, again, there's only so much info about him at this particular time, so I won't go into any speculative points, but he definitely is a bit intriguing. I can't say he's different from what I was expecting. He doesn't really go out of his way to attack the owl crew and more just leaves them to their devices. We also see he's got some sort of problem having to do with a curse or some sort of plague he has. The show even decides to give us a face reveal fairly early on. Of course, it's just like that Justice League moment though. I have no idea who this is. But it does go against expectation because it could have been left closer to the end. There's still more to be seen about him, but he does leave you guessing what's up. Some characters that we only got a small glimpse of in season one actually went way beyond what we thought they were gonna be. That being Amity's parents, Odalia and Alador Blight. At first in our minds, we thought they were just gonna be the basic bitch nobles, you know, wanting the absolute best for their children, all for the sake of their family name, pushing their kids to be prim and proper and total loyalists to the emperor. But instead, they just turned out to be capitalist pigs. Of course, they are overbearing to Amity, particularly Odalia, by wanting her to focus more on her studies, even going so far as to get Amity's friends expelled. What a bitch. We get to see just how controlling she is of Amity by telepathically invading Amity's mind and giving her commands. Wait a minute, hold on. Yeah, it's pretty fucked. Not sure if they're gonna follow up with that factoid, but it does flip things on its head. But there's another subversion that ended up happening with the subversion. What a twist! Alador doesn't seem that interested in trying to control Amity from what we've seen. Granted, we've only gotten a bit of him, but he comes across as possibly having some positive motives to him by the way he was looking at Amity stand up for her friends and save Luz. Kinda has that I'm proud of my daughter vibe to it. It acts as a sort of challenge to the preconceptions you may have had about him. 
There was a major thing that got introduced back in the first season. We found out that someone was sending letters to Luz's mom with Luz none the wiser. We speculated thinking it would be some giant conspiracy involving Bellos or Ida or maybe even Luz's dad. This season showed off another hint in that it's a doppelganger of Luz, kind of proving the theory of creepy Luz to have some weight to it. Then the mid-season finale came and we found out it was a basilisk named V that escaped back in the first episode of season one and disguised herself as Luz. This definitely goes against what we were expecting because we found out that she actually has no ill intentions. She was just trying to get away from Bellos. There's no bigger conspiracy or nothing. She just took Luce's place and went to camp for her, which explains the letters being written. We were prepared to hate her, but what ended up happening is now everyone wants to protect her. She just seems so sweet and innocent in all this, especially when she gets captured by a flat earther nut job. Witches and demons are real. <gasps> And they're all sent from Mars to harvest human teeth to power their time machine! You don't actually know anything about us, do you? You're savage. I adore. It goes against what we were expecting by not having been a part of something more grand. This puts things in a whole new perspective for us and keeps us more on our toes for what's to come next. We can't really keep thinking it's going to be some big grand thing that goes to the overarching narrative. Sometimes it could just be something sort of small and simple, and it still manages to fit within everything just properly. Now, from the mid-season finale, we managed to get a better look into Luz's mother, Camila Noceta. Normally parents in these type of stories don't get much time dedicated to them. Camila changes things up with how she gets on board with Luz when she finds out about everything. We are are left on a heartbreaking note with her though. You get her being upset since in her mind her own child chose to run away. You chose to stay there? Oh, uh, were you trying to live out some witch fantasy? Did you, did you hate living with me that much? Come on, no! When you come home, promise you'll stay here. I didn't mean to push you away. I swear things will be different. Mom, it's not you, it never was. Trust me, Luz. Usually the parents would freak out a bit with the child going to another world and be over it, but with Camila she believes that Luz left her behind because Luz thought she wasn't a good mother. It's a subtle line, but it gets across a lot that we'll hopefully see more of. Camila kind of shows off why escaping to another world, especially for a selfish desire, isn't exactly the best. But the show is clever by not having it be so black and white. Luz was wrong for staying in the boiling aisles without telling her mom, but it makes sense why she would leave since she doesn't really have any friends back in the human realm. And Camila was wrong for sending Luz to some camp without really talking to her about what's going on with her. But it makes sense why since Luz was over the top with her creativity to the point it hurt people. Both are right, but both are wrong. Cosmic. It adds a nice sense of a moral gray area to the mom and daughter relationship while playing against the idea of escaping to a fantasy world. Also, people calling Camila a bad mom because they thought she hated Luz's creativity need to sit down. Camila wasn't mad at Luz for being creative. Luz in the first episode literally unleashed a bunch of snakes on everyone. Luz was in trouble for going over the top and hurting people, not because she's imaginative. Hell, Camila even said she likes Luz's creativity. Miha, I love your creativity, but it's gotten out of hand. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll play along. I know this stuff made school difficult, but I'm glad you're still being creative. Now, does that sound like someone who doesn't like their child's creativity? Come on now. We could have just had it so Luz is very much in the right, but the show makes the audience have to second guess the protagonist, which is much better and nuanced. Now, there's definitely a massive subversion when it comes to the actual world of the Boiling Isles. Even though it's referred to as the Demon Realm, it actually to a degree is more accepting than Earth. This was mentioned by the creator Dana Terrence in an interview with Rebecca Rose that the Boiling Isles has no prejudice against same-sex couples. It avoids that whole problem and just allows people to live somewhat freely in that regard. Only in that regard, considering you can't write weird fan fiction there. The stupid warden likes to lock people up who don't fit in. Like, I write fanfics of food falling in love. I like food, I like love. Just let me write about it! What an odd thing to say. As well as the dictatorship that they live under, but regardless, they don't really have any phobic tendencies. There's even this nice subtle moment where Luz reveals to Ida that she wants to ask Amity out, and Ida simply tells her to just do it. It may not be much, but it's a pleasant way of them just making it clear that there's no problem with her wanting to date a girl. It's treated just like any other relationship. Even though Luz is human, they treat her like she's just another resident there. Now that's true equality. That's important. 
That's honestly just what's so amazing about this entire series. It pushes beyond its own boundaries and even basic standards that we often see in animation. It became a tour de force with its constant trends on social media whenever a new episode comes out. There's constant theories being made with most of them not even coming close to what it ends up actually doing, leaving everyone to second guess themselves on what to expect. It pulls in many by playing against our expectations. Each episode of season 2 has been a banger that gives more than you bargain for. Now we're just waiting for some stuff in terms of Luz's friends like Gus and Willow. Particularly more Willow, but I'm sure we'll see something happen with her. There's still half a season left at the time of this video, but this first half has got me pretty excited for where everything's going. Especially since we have no clue what's on the horizon. But I want to know what you all think about this season so far. Leave a comment below, and always remember, it's just a thought. Please! Philip! I want to go home. Blaine! We gotta stick together! I'm sorry. Not this time. But I can keep you safe. Well, things have certainly... Shall we say evolved since last time, huh? With the latest season wrapping up, the Owl House has gone through some major developments from my last video. A lot of which definitely made some of us say, Damn, nigga! Now you should definitely know who I'm referring to when I say some of us with this one. These new revelations actually further prove my point about this series, which if you forgot, I'll kindly remind you of, but please actually go watch that one. My main point from that video was that the Owl House breaks the fantasy of what to expect from your average fantasy series or serialized cartoon. It's a series that makes a name for itself by going against the grain, be it through the tropes or even the characters like Hootie. <laughs> At no point will we ever figure out what he even is or supposed to be. What is he? The show already solidified itself as one of Disney's most unique series along with its contemporary Amphibia. And then they cut it short, so yeah. Idiot! This is why we praise the creators and crews of your favorite cartoons, folks. They deserve far more praise than the companies. Hashtag new deal for animation. But anyway, it pushed beyond what you would expect from this show either through challenging people's theories or challenging the character's mental states. For real, these characters are put through the ringer in the second half of season two. They are going to need the meanest amount of counseling. I've been traumatized! But with season two fully wrapping up and building on the show's trope challenging feats, I think it's only necessary to go over even more about how the series breaks the fantasy. Before we get into things, I should note that I'm only slightly going to touch upon the first half of season two for clarification's sake since I already covered it before. So again, go see my first video on the subject if you really want all the proper context. Enough wasting any more time though, let's kick this pig. The what? None of this feels right. I'll do anything to save humanity from evil. You promised you'd play with me! Magic or not, I think you'll make your predecessors proud. Probably should have gone with a more somber song to introduce this section, but anyway, we're gonna do things a smidge different here since certain events of the series are total spoilers or play a major role in character arcs we're gonna get into later. I talked about Bellows before in my last Owl House video and mentioned how I couldn't really go into detail about him because there was so much mystery surrounding him. Well, season 2B completely cracked the case on that one. In this half of the season, we learn of Bellos' real name and even his history with him being confirmed to be Philip Wittebane from the journal Lose Guy. We all were able to put two and two together, but it's an interesting way to have a connection to the villain be someone the main protagonist thought they could trust. 
Things get pushed further when Luz and Lilith go back in time and learn about Philip and his escapades in that he's a total jagoff. He's a straight up master manipulator who sacrifices anyone to get what he wants. It was implied in the first half of the season that more happened at this Eclipse Lake expedition, which we learn he let his crew die in order to get himself out of the cave. Way to go, a-hole! This actually makes Bellos a pretty interesting villain. We've seen master manipulators, but one that is allowed to go all the way without terrible he can be is pretty different. He's willing to say whatever to get whatever. He doesn't think about the ramifications it can have on others so long as it benefits him. It plays into how much of a hypocrite he can be when he says that he wants to protect humanity, but he was willing to kill another human. There's also a subtle thing done in the background of the Hollow Mind episode where it's shown that Bellos, it's Philip, whatever, went as far as to kill his own brother. It's a case of telling a story within a story by using the images of the background. It's a nice means to give details without stopping the plot because boy did that episode have a lot to reveal. Bellos is basically revealed to be Philip Toulouse and Hunter and was a witch hunter in the human realm. Which makes perfect sense because he's from the time period that hated witches and has the belief that they're out to hurt humans. Him being connected to the Connecticut witch trials puts it all into perspective of what his real goal is. At first we're made to believe that he wants to get rid of wild magic but it's just a red herring. What he really wants is to use the day of unity to wipe out all witches once and for all. Permanently. Does it once and for all sort of imply permanently? Nerds. It's interesting because it's set up perfectly when you look back at the first half of the season. When Luz saw her mom, you see the statues of the two brothers, one of them being Philip, and you realize Luz lives in Connecticut. Basically, do some research and you can connect the dots. But let's face it, the trauma of going to school probably kept most of us from doing that. But regardless, it works to really play against what the audience was thinking. Many thought it would just be a simple stop the bad guy from destroying a magic source, but on look back, the show never truly showed what wild magic is supposed to be. We just know it's magic done without the covens. Bellos invented them so you realize he was full of it the whole time. The coven sigils are also put into perspective with the fact that he just wants to keep the witches nerfed because otherwise he'd get walked like a dog if they weren't. Let's be real, he was pretty much scared of Ida being the most powerful witch on the Boiling Isles. Not to mention how undoubtedly weak he is. Getting picked on by witches, getting decked by Lilith in the past. Speaking of the past, there's time travel in this series. Oh. Now I know, time travel can be very difficult to get right in just about any piece of media, but the Owl House wouldn't be breaking the fantasy if it didn't approach this in a creative yet subverting way. They make it so it can only be done at a certain place at a certain time and that place and time is random and always changing. So it can never be a solution to a problem because it would be too difficult to use in an emergency. It keeps the heroes on their toes so they can't have an easy way out, making the audience potentially anxious when things go south, cause they very much go south. Bellos pretty much screws with Luce by revealing himself as Philip and telling her how she helped him in finding the important artifact that goes to this person called the Collector. We even see that this curse is basically the palisman he consumes fighting to get out. It really pushes him in terms of how villainous he can be. His overly manipulative ways come from a time period when snake oil salesmen were out and about, so we see how he tricked a lot of the boiling aisles in going along with his crazy schemes. Just a master manipulator with no regard for others. Definitely makes him stand as a very notable Disney villain. Granted, most people probably try not to count TV villains, but I'm willing to bet that they huff blue, so we'll ignore them. But what's interesting with Bellos is his way of manipulating those around him. He goes as far as to use his manipulative nature against something that would be considered a god. The Collector is somebody that doesn't get fully introduced until this second half. There's some type of entity that got trapped in that in-between space Luz was in by the original Titan for some reason. Mist, I remember someone throwing me off a bridge. I'm not angry though. Say, you wanna play tag? I'm it. Yeah. They needed to be locked up. Can't have something like that just out and about coupled with the fact that they have a mindset of a child. That just equals a whole lot of Oh hell no! But what makes them interesting is the fact that they got played to help Bellos out with his plan for the Day of Unity, even though they're so much stronger than him. What makes them subversive is how so many people assumed they were gonna possess Luz by the end of the season. 
I don't know how people came to that conclusion since one, Luce is just a human with no real magic so they'd gain nothing, and two, actually that's the best and only argument you need. But it's crazy how many theorized as hard as they could, but the series completely played against that expectation. Now, we still don't know much about them, but they definitely leave a strong impression, kind of putting them up there with the likes of, say, Bill Cipher even. Definitely somebody who you want to pay attention to and figure out what's going to happen with them. But Subversion doesn't stop at the main baddies. There was some proper clarity on the character of Alador. I correctly assume that there were subtle hints in the first half of the season that indicate that he wasn't as bad a parent as we thought. In the Reaching Out episode, we find out that Amity and her siblings aren't too angry towards him. Amity makes it clear that they just want him to spend some time with them and to actually stand up for them when Odalia is bugging. It subtly hinted that Amity had an affinity towards her father more than her mother with the fact that she uses his magic instead of hers. We're made even more aware with the fact that she pushes for his attention, making it clear that she does want him as a part of her life, but is still weary of him. Amity even breaks a few tropes by not immediately forgiving Alador for his neglect, keeping him at arm's length because he still has some making up to do, but they actually allow him to make up for his past by having him fight against the Emperor and disobey his wife. I'm going to spend more time with my kids, get to know them. Things are going to change after the Day of Unity. We're led to believe that he always wanted to be a good father, but he was held back by Odalia, who turned out to be a total jackass. She ends up going along with the Day of Unity simply because she's led to believe by Bellos that her and the family will become royalty. With the Emperor's favor, we'll live like royalty in the New World. Crowns and everything! Like, come on, dog. It's so obvious Bellos is lying, but she just goes along because of her sense of greed, which even a bunch of the Covenheads fell for, too. Just a cavalcade of idiots these people are. It's honestly pretty funny when you think about the fact that because of this and the revelations about Bellos and the Day of Unity, that her family has completely left her. She is without anybody, all because of her selfishness and greed. And she is just now completely and undoubtedly alone. I feel fantastic and I never felt as good as how I do right now except for maybe when I think about how I felt that day when I felt the way that I do right now. But I digress. Their relationship is pretty different with how it's revealed to be set up. We're basically told that their marriage was a sham and just a business decision. Ain't no love with these two. It could have easily been the case that both are bad or in on the business arrangement and agree with it, but here Alador is obviously miserable which explains why he's so tired in the way he's designed. Alador just works as a great subversion from the bad parent trope that we usually get. The gullibility we we seen from Odalia actually extends to the character of Kikimura, which is more extensive. With Kiki, she's desperate to get away from Bellos, but very much wants to do better in the ranks. She went along with Luz's plan, but betrayed her the second she hears she might get a promotion, only to find that all she gets is to live. Which she would have gotten if she went along with Luz's plan. You stupid. You really gotta slap the dumbass label on these characters, cause jeez. It just shows how it subverts the expectation of these characters because you would think they're playing 4D chess, but in reality, they're just pawns themselves. Or thinking they might redeem themselves in the end, but that doesn't seem to be likely. There's another character who actually plays against the expectation by working against Bellows. Darius, the leader of the Abomination Coven, turned out to be leading a rebellion with Eberwolf of the Beast Coven. We actually thought that Darius and Eber were going to stop Rain and Eda, but they were actually going to recruit them into the rebellion. Actually, when Darius captured me, he was really protecting me. I thought I was the only one who found this day of unity junk suspicious. When I heard Rain was causing trouble, I had a feeling they'd know more. You would have been locked away if it weren't for me. And a little less bruised. This goes even further with how he treats Hunter. At first, we're led to believe that he finds Hunter annoying, but in reality, he just wants Hunter to actually be a kid rather than some lackey for the Emperor. It works to set up how he clearly is not as bad as you would think. There's this great sense of deceit that puts the audience on their toes, wondering who to trust and how the story is going to unfold. But this all culminates to how our main couple is affected by all these different factors as well as their own stories. You already know who I'm talking about. The most beloved power couple in the series. <laughs> no, you brain damaged people. <laughs> no! I'm talking about Lumity! Come on now. 
I'm okay taking things one day at a time. But I can't help if I don't know what's going on. Thank you for listening. I can't wait to pick flowers with you. I just want to know that Luce is safe. No monsters, no mysteries, no deadly duels. It's going to be the most mundane slice of life date ever. And it'll be awesome. Oh, it's a nice thought, right? You would think with everything that happened in the first half, there wouldn't be much to discuss about these two, but you'd be surprisingly wrong on that front. So, you know, shame on you. Shame. 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 There's so much given to them, be it individually or as a pair. Now, I blue balled you Lumity stands long enough, so I'll discuss them as a pair first. Don't act like I don't spoil y'all. Luz and Amity are shown in a way that you don't normally get from animated couples. We're given time to see them develop their relationship past the initial phase of entering one. There's the shyness and the cutesy nicknames, but we're given the turmoil that comes with it. Luz has gone as far as to lie to Amity or at the very least withhold information. They could so easily fall to the cliche of Amity getting super upset and run off and not listen to Luz, but like I've said before, this show likes to go against the grain and she does give Luz the time to explain why she lied. And when you told me about the problem with your dad, I don't know, maybe I was jealous or just needed a distraction. I was dumb. I'm sorry. Amity is understanding that this was something that really did affect Luz in a way she couldn't personally understand, but she does understand that her girlfriend is upset and needs comforting. There's two instances of this, but this is the strongest case, honestly. The big message with these two is the idea of communication among partners, trusting each other to come clean on something bothering them, rather than just hold it in and pretend it doesn't pain you. It's a good juxtaposition with Ida and Rain's relationship. With Rain and Ida, Ida was constantly hiding her curse and being untruthful about what's going on with her, shutting out those close to her. It's even bad on Rain's part by just them giving up entirely instead of trying to figure out what's going on with Ida. With Luz and Amity, they put trust in each other and give some space and actually work to make sure the relationship works. They don't just let the other suffer, but they respect each other's boundaries, showcasing the balancing act of having a relationship. We've seen it all too often with these teen stories where it's just a petty drama of one not being truthful or hiding away their problems. With Lumity, they break the mold and teach a good lesson that listening to your partner is vital. Crazy how two cartoon teenage girls can understand relationships better than most people. But the strengths of these two come from their individual traits. With Amity, we got more of her evolution as a better character. They could have easily left her with just dating Luz and being nice to her or her friends, but we actually have Amity pushing to be a better friend. When it comes to Willow, we saw her clearly be a pious jerk towards her at the beginning. Now, there was mostly just the one episode in season one where they got to reconcile, but this second half of season two gave some time for them to develop their rekindled friendship. Amity basically tries being overprotective of Willow when the school gets invaded by the Emperor's Coven. At first, we're led to believe it's Amity regressing, especially with a certain comment she makes at the beginning. I went by and checked out the Owl House. It was crawling with Coven Scouts. I was thinking of capturing one for information, but... It's okay, Willow. They're tough. Not everyone can stand up to them. Really, nigga? But then it's shown she just doesn't want to lose her friend again. It solidifies Amity's growth. We've seen a redemption for characters before with it being involved with the main character, but here it's done among the supporting characters with proper time and dedication which put a few people to shame, but we'll pop that zip when we get to it. It's a great way to maintain that even though they are on better terms, they still got some work to do, and that just emphasizes the point of bettering yourself for you and others. Beautiful. Now, Luz, on the other hand, goes through a lot, but has significant growth. She's a long way from the bright-eyed, innocent kid at the beginning and a more traumatized ball of stress. Yes, this mama is ready for trauma. Give me your skin! <laughs> Yeah, they step even more into the main character getting traumatized thing here. It's far different from those YA stories where the main character goes through the heavy stuff but isn't exactly phased by it in the end. 
The one animated series where they have the main character affected is Steven Universe, and that was more at the end when Steven got older and he didn't know how to deal with his emotions. Here we see in real time how Luz is affected by all those traumatic experiences. It did become emphasized in her character when she went into Bellos' mind. She's told that she helped him gain the means for his rise to power. Bellos plays mental games with her by showing how he came to power all while pretending to be the innocent side of himself. She finds out that everything was to kill every witch on the aisle. This whole experience makes Luz panic and fear that things aren't going to be okay. She's done being optimistic and silly. She's constantly trying to make sure her and her owl family can make it out of this ordeal okay. It makes you gain a sense of worry yourself. The free spirited one is basically wearing their emotions on their sleeves and letting it be known they're scared as hell. Ida? Ida, can, can you hear me? I'll listen to you now. I'll do whatever you say. Just uh. fight back. Please, Ida! Damn! She's clearly not in the best state mentally because her fantasy is starting to break. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! It fully set in that this is far beyond what she comprehended would be a fun adventure. Even when she talks about finally taking Amity on a date, she expresses making it the most mundane ever, a telling sign that this world stopped being fun for her. She even hides the fact that she held Bellows from her friends, fearing the reaction she might get. This then mixes in with her sense of heroism when she pulls out all the stops to end the Day of Unity, to trying to bargain with Bellows, to tricking Bellows and making him stop the Day of Unity, to trying to sacrifice herself to allow her friends to save themselves as the world around them is potentially destroyed. Everything comes to a head when King pushes Luz and her friends through the portal and it closes and they're back in the human realm. <gasps> hey mom, I'm back. Those tears and that smile are the perfect symbol of the type of character Luz is. Always hiding behind a facade, but deep down she's terrified and in pain. Her being home and seeing her mom with her friends should be the happiest moment for her, but it comes at the cost of so many people lost and her friends being trapped and away from their families. It even goes with how she remembers certain things that happened to her. When you come home, you'll stay with me and you'll never go back to that place. Mom, it's not you. It never was. Please. Okay, Mom. I promise. When you come home, promise you'll stay here. I didn't mean to push you away. I swear things will be different. Mom, it's not you. It never was. Promise me, Luz. Please. Now, we'll only have the next season to confirm the full meaning, but for now, it makes it clear that her mind is pretty scattered and very cloudy, which can affect her decision-making skills. We saw it earlier in the Reaching Out episode when she explained her family traditions. She's smiling, but she's weak in the knees and can't even walk at one point. It puts her in a completely different perspective as a character that is more in pain than you can imagine. It's so subtly done, but has the strongest impact with the last frame of the season. And you're left to wonder, how is she going to take in all of this next season with no knowledge of what happened to her Owl House family, or her friends family even, or thinking of the fact that her actions led to this destruction of the Boiling Isles without her knowing? It really does goes to show how this series goes above and beyond what you'd expect, especially for a Disney series, which probably explains why they canceled it, but it does make you see why this series is different from your regular fantasy fodder. But it all doesn't stop at the main characters and extends to that of the supporting cast. Would you like to hear about them? Yeah! Uh, uh, oh, you're all actually invested this time. Damn, wish I had something prepared. Uh... Distraction for the mid-break! She and King are children. They shouldn't have to deal with this. I can't even trust myself anymore. No, no, I'm here! I, 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 gotta, I gotta run! We're here because I made a bad call. I wanna go home. The Owl House does give a lot of love to its main cast, but there's no lack of love given to the supporting characters. One who I honestly avoided talking about in the last video was Hunter. I mainly didn't mention him because of the fact that he seemed pretty straightforward. Most people guessed that he was gonna go good and join up with Luz's crew, which did happen, but that doesn't mean there's no subversion happening with him. We find out in the second half of the season that he's something called a Grimwalker, and from what it seems, he's a clone of a man named Caleb, who's Bellos' brother that he killed. It's pretty heavy a revelation and they go about it by showcasing his sense of panic when he realizes Bellos will be after him. He knows. He, he knows we were in there. I can't... I can't go back. 
kid. Breathe. <laughs> We've seen characters have pretty exaggerated panic attacks, but here it's done more in an effective and realistic light that many can easily understand and connect with. Throughout the season, Hunter is given small details picking away at him going good. Be it Bellos not giving him a chance to really prove himself or constantly hiding stuff away from him, or Amity showing him some form of kindness. He even thinks about all the hardships he and a few other recruits had to go through. He had to wake up at 6am, had harsh training that required him to be left at the top of a mountain and scale it downwards. No wonder he's so frantic, I'd be crazy too if that type of stuff was happening to me. You can see why anyone would have doubts about this coven. It's driven home with Willow and Gus accepting him into the group or making him think differently about his upbringing. Be it Willow getting him to question the coven's methods or Gus getting him to realize that he can trust his own mind and know that Bellows is evil. It also plays on the idea of the bad guy getting convinced to go good. Here it's done by the supporting cast more than the main character. Luz gets a few moments with him but nothing as strong as Gus and Willow or even Amity in terms of his turn. It really puts more emphasis on Gus and Willow in their agency as characters and really makes you think about how important they truly are to this story. Speaking of those two, finally it was put to rest with so many people thinking Willow and Gus were given the shaft. Like seriously people, there was a whole nother half of the season to get through and everyone was just ready to say those two were mistreated or forgotten. Some even going as far as to try to claim or imply racism, which y'all try to wrap your heads around that one. I got a thousand thoughts and I ain't trying to waste them on that bullshit. Goes to show just let the story play out. But saltiness aside, Willow and Gus are given something unique in their development. With Willow, she was seen as a nothing type of person or a half a witch, someone people overlooked or thought was worthless and she went against the grain by possibly being the strongest in her friend group. It goes further with her taking on the leadership role as part of a school sports team. Usually the best friends don't go too far in developing, but here she's gone far enough that if they wanted to, next season they could make her the leader of the group considering what happened at the end. Now, they don't make her perfect, they let there be some lingering doubts about herself, but we see her succeed and save her teammates and show that she shouldn't be underestimated. Same goes for Gus. Now, he seemed like just a simple kid with powers that couldn't go that far, especially since it can't physically do anything since they're illusions, but we get to see the fullest extent of this power with it being something that affects his mind. We see his own insecurities take image and berate him, giving a visual representation of anxiety and to a somewhat gruesome extent hints of schizophrenia. It doesn't shy away from something that many teenagers would go through and considering our economy, many adults are going through too. But anyway, it's set up pretty early on in the series with him trying his best to keep his leadership position at his human club. He falls for easy setups, be it from Matha Olimu or Mia in the Looking Glass Ruins. He's gullible and it eats at him until he makes a giant illusion that engulfs the whole school. But his connection with his friends are what help ground him and pull him out of his own mind. Cosmic. It even showcases that he still is a pretty strong illusionist, that they shouldn't be underdogs. Like, we saw how crazy he could get in the first half of season two with some of the very gruesome imagery that he put out. <laughs> it can't actually hurt me. It can't even touch me. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just shit myself. These two go beyond just being a comic relief or even just emotional support and hold their own as well-rounded characters. Now you're probably wondering if Ida or even Lilith are given anything subversive this half of the season. Well, there are a few things to note. Lilith did start out pretty rough with everything from being in the Emperor's Covenant and all, but then redeeming herself by helping out the Owl Group. They took things a step further by having her play more into a familial role for Luz. Her and Luz are given their own adventure and she plays up her silliness and adopts the moniker of the cool Aunt Lilith. A bad girl historian like myself is all about taking risks, so let's boogie down to history town. I am so in love with her right now. It's a definite far cry from her more noble, no-nonsense attitude she once had. But the opposite ends up happening with Ida. She starts to take in the weight of the situation her and her found family are in. She recognizes that things are looking grim and she doesn't really have a means to protect everyone. She doesn't even have a plan. We see this start to weigh on her with her having breakdowns or swallowing her pride and accepting help to make sure King and Luz are safe when her home is raided and Belos' goons are barreling down on her. 
We saw this clearly brewing in her mind when she thought Rain was now under Bellos' control. She's given some levity when she's told that Rain is on her side. It has the strongest clarity for her when she finally reconciles with her father, who she was ashamed of approaching because she gave him a permanent damage to his hand when she went into the owl beast form, basically making it so he can no longer do his job of making palismans. It's a great scene between them that lets her know that nobody hates her for shutting them out because of her curse and she needs to be honest about what's happening with her from now on, which we see when she finally reveals that she has no plan with Luz. <laughs> don't have magic and we don't have allies we're useless we have you and king so i wasn't gonna do anything to make sure that you were safe she's learned to accept her role as a mother figure and make hard decisions to keep her family safe she's taking her role as a mentor to a higher level than what you would normally get it all plays on to the found family and mentor trope and pushes it as far as it can go with each character willing to make some form of sacrifice but it all comes through fruition with the biggest sacrifice involving King. Boy, does he have a lot going on with him. From what I said in the last video, he breaks that mold of just being the silly sidekick to being a well-rounded character, but this second half took that and ran straight on with it. I should preface first that a certain theory I came up with in the last video and said I was wrong about, we can just pretend I didn't say anything cause it turns out I was wrong about being wrong. What a twist! Yeah, so it turns out King is the son of the original Titan, which they spell out clearly, almost if they're trying to mock me. We find this out when they finally follow up on the letter King received earlier in the season. We're led to think that he's finally found his real family, but it's all a lie and turns out to be the people who killed his family. Dude, this is pretty fucked up right here. The group turned out to worship the collector who King was hidden away from. They even wore the hides of King's people and killed the children as well. Why? A little trauma can build character for kids, people. This all has a strong effect on King to the point he reassesses himself and his wants and desires. He finds that even after getting what he always dreamed about, that it's not what he wants. He doesn't enjoy being treated as a god or put on some pedestal. In the beginning, that's all he ever wanted, but now he sees he's treated differently, especially with Lilith Boggan and doesn't want that. A good case of getting what you wanted, but not what you need. He's definitely a long way from that silly kid we got at the start of the series. More mature in his thinking, clearly a bit unsure of himself but knows that hard choices are going to have to be made, which we see with him choosing to release the Collector to get them to stop the Day of Unity, all under the guise that he's just gonna play with them. It's a big decision that saves everyone but puts Luce and her friends in a state of uncertainty since he makes another difficult decision to push them through the portal to the human realm. Luce, I'm so happy I had you as a big sister. No! King! It's amazing how King can go from just being seen as the sort of mascot for the series to being this quintessential character willing to do what it takes to keep his family safe. Everything from this season played against expectation. So many fans did as much speculating as possible, but a small few were able to guess how things would turn out. That's honestly what helps elevate this series and a few of its contemporaries above the fray. It looks at past stories and tries to either improve upon them or try a different route that past creators weren't thinking about, creating a new experience that gathers fans of those old stories or even new ones. It's no real wonder how the series was able to become so popular in just a short amount of time. It even went as far as to trend over the latest season of Stranger Things for a brief period. That's just power at that point. Now some might argue that it's only popular cause of the shipping. It's okay to be wrong, just don't be loud and wrong. People did come in for the shipping, but the lore, the drama, the world, the characters, that's what makes people stay. It's what makes people cosplay as these characters or theorize what's going to happen next. The subversion is the biggest draw for some who like having their expectations challenged. There's still one sadly shortened season after this that's gonna add all the context that will be possible with the three three 40 minute specials they have in store, but I'm sure they won't disappoint. It's not just your basic fantasy series that you don't need to think about. It's a once in a while show that stays in your mind even when it's gone. But that's just my thoughts on the matter. What did you all think about this season? Did it meet your expectations or completely throw you off? Let me know in the comments and always remember, it's just a thought.
this one is a bit of a more symbolic question. It maybe it's putting you on the spot, but I do want to ask: What is the Owl House? I think it's it's. <laughs> <laughs> well we finally made it the last season of the owl house it's kind of crazy to think that a show with only three seasons could have such a strong impact but we've seen that before with stuff like amphibia and even avatar the good one (laughs) but the owl house is a special case due to the fact that its third season was cut short sadly What makes it stand with other examples, though, is the impression it left. In a small amount of time of just three years, this show put a mark on the zeitgeist that could take a bit longer to leave. But it's not hard to imagine how it did that. From all the characters' unique dilemmas to pushing progress on ways LGBTQ plus issues can be written in family entertainment, there are no doubts about the way this series impacted people. The characters spoke to people by touching on the idea of growing up and wanting to escape to your fantasies. We see the harshness that can come from that sort of mindset. And trust me, they make these characters live with that harshness. Can't count how many times Luz's life was put on the line. But you know what they say, trauma builds character. At least some insane people have told me that. It certainly got people talking that it's been a minute since we last saw something like that happen. This last season, I believe, brings everything home by nailing exactly how the characters process everything going on with them. We get the conclusions to the arcs that were purposely set up. And I think it's time to give it the spotlight it deserves. So I'm doing it like the last few times, but it'll be a bit different. Each section is going to be focused on what happened in each special versus just what's been happening in each character across the board. But let's not waste any more time and light these glyphs. Let's see you come up with a better segue. someone else and then there'd be no one left to fight back i know what i have to do now the first special did have a lot to live up to unsurprisingly it basically had to reintroduce the dilemma the characters are going through as well as establish the new problems they all have to face while making sure it all connects succinctly with it being the first one you could imagine it being nervous like if you were the first to present your school project but i don't know why you would imagine that since it's just a tv show and not a person seek help if you are but for real the special was able to get the audience on board with the premise through a pretty good montage it does its job well by getting you up to speed on everyone and their adjustments to the human realm would have loved to see maybe a quarter of seasons worth of those adventures but you know we're not allowed to have nice things i hate it here though a guy named tune for thought came up with a cool idea where we could get like two minute shorts showcasing that stuff It would be pretty cool, I'd be down for it, but I digress. Major revelations are made through this montage. One of the biggest being that Luz actually came out as bi to her mom and revealed that she's dating Amity. It's played fairly small and quick, but it gets across the message that parents should be accepting of their children, normalizing it and moving forward without any preachiness. This even speaks a bit to how Camila is actually more accepting of who Luz is and what she cares about. We'll dive more into that angle in a few. We see the constant failed attempts at making a portal and how the Owl Gang is getting used to Earth culture. Gas Queen. It's very much assumed that they haven't been on Earth for too long with them showing up at maybe around the end of the summer, but it gets across that it wasn't too hard for them to get somewhat accustomed to things. Keyword somewhat. They also subvert things by keeping the gang out of school. Most other fantasy shows would just have them attend with lose and get into all sorts of mischief, but they avoid that since time is of the essence. Just 
pretty good storytelling in only a short amount of time. The special itself gives some more on the Owl Gang's adjustments to being in the human realm. It's done in a montage form, but it's fun to see. That girl's just having too much fun, I tell you. We see the gang on their mission to find what they can on making a new portal. The things they do somehow match up with the dangers they face in the Boiling Isles, even proving why giraffes were banished to Earth. I knew we couldn't trust those long necked jerks. While they go on this search, we even find out more about Belos' backstory, or more or less the full clarity of events that went down with him being jealous of his older brother Caleb, who got with a witch and even going as far as killing him. Damn! Pretty dark, yeah. But that's honestly expected. Hell, we even see Belos possessing animals to keep himself alive, and they don't spare the details of the destroyed bodies that get left behind. Sadly, we could only get so much of V, but she's still adorable as always. Tres tristes tigres comen en tres tristes platos de trigo. Perfecto! You're our top student! Yes, queen. From what we do get, she at least seems to be seen as part of the family. Would have been great to see if there could have been some tensions between her and Hunter and Amity, considering Hunter was part of the Emperor's Covenant and Amity did get hurt by a basilisk, so that would be something that I wish we got to see, but what they could do was still nice. Just V being part of the group with no hassle. I'm always here for more V. It's made clear how the events of what happened in Season 2 are weighing on Luz. She starts looking far more unsure of herself. Cementing more how that happy-go-lucky team we see at the beginning is basically gone. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that her character changed, but more that she had to grow up. This further pushes the narrative through line that's been running through this whole series. Luz was a protagonist that just wanted to have a fantasy escape like one of those YA novels she reads. But what she got was a reality check that made it very clear that you might not actually want that. And it's honestly amazing to think that these books that she was given were given to her by her late father. It's the last connection she has to him, so you really understand why she would want to escape to this whole fantasy realm stuff because it's the last gift from her dad. That's really heartbreaking when you think about it. But reality did have to come crashing down on her. She thought it would be fun and games and making some friends and having cool adventures, but what she didn't realize is that in those novels, people get hurt and sometimes even killed. So wanting that type of adventure means getting exactly all the positives and negatives. She has to experience everything that her escapism would entail. Kind of a subtle message to those that want to only fixate on the escapes. It's all fun and games, but that's all it is, fun and games. If it were real and you were the main character, you would be pretty miserable like the main characters you're fans of. We see the full extent of this with how she's trying to hide the fact that she unknowingly helped Bellos in the past. Luz's guilt about her and Bellos goes as far as her wishing she never even existed, which can be summed up to her wishing she was dead. They should hate his guts, and it would be better if he literally never existed. Oh my god! Yeah, they go that far for Luz, saying her friends would be better off if she didn't exist. Not better if they never met, but better if she wasn't alive. It's dark, but it gets things across at how dire she feels about herself. But you can't blame her for feeling this way since she feels she's the reason for everything going wrong, including the horrible dictatorship that plagued the Boiling Isles for decades. That's gotta be a heavy mental toll that she's carrying all on her own. But the thing for her is that she has her friends there to tell her exactly what she needs to hear. They give the truth that at the end of the day, it wasn't her fault. Literally anyone could have been tricked by Bellows, and whether or not she went into the past, it doesn't really matter. He would have just found someone else or discovered the light glyph on his own and found the collector at a later date in the past. It's made clear that her friends are with her no matter what, and that's something she doesn't have to worry about anymore. But it seems it doesn't stop her from thinking about staying on Earth. But but we'll touch on that later. With everything that goes on with Luz, it's a good reason why she's a strong subversive character because of the reality check aspect to her and how the crazy events she's gone through affect her. It fully comes to a head when you get to her relationship with Camila, but we'll get into that in the next special. But speaking of Camila, there's some interesting revelations we learn about her. For instance, we were made to believe to a degree that she really wasn't too much on Luz's side, but a nightmare she has tells us that she was very supportive of Luz's weird behavior. She would easily go to bat for her daughter. Gross, now everything smells like lunch meat. Yeah, she's such a tryhard. 
Oh yeah, what did you just say? Just being a very protective mom who will beat down a mother. It showcases that Camila was always sticking up for Luz, but the situation we saw at the beginning was just a case of Luz taking things too far and needing some form of punishment that encouragement wasn't going to help with. To go on a side tangent, this is why it was some weirdo behavior that people were calling Camila a bad mother for going with sending Luz off to a summer camp. She just had to do what she thought was the right thing to do since Luz was endangering people. It's just crazy that people thought Camila doing that was terrible, but let's face it, y'all would do the same if y'all were in her shoe. Cause again, Luz released snakes on the school. Camila is a widow slash single mother taking care of a child with very hyperactive tendencies. You can't imagine how hard it must be for her since she wants to stick up for her daughter, but sadly has to remember that other people exist and you can't just do things that mess with them. So you're getting that major struggle of wanting to look out for your kid, but having to think about how they affect the world around them. But thankfully, this special knows this and we get a feeling of Camila going along with Luz's adventures in the Boiling Isle. They get more into it in the next one, but for this one moment towards Towards the end, it tells you that Camila understands Luz's want to be in the demon realm and even encourages her to go back and face Bellows. Obviously to protect her child, but also recognizing this is something very important to her. Not to mention the fact that a bunch of people are going to die if they don't stop him, but one problem at a time. It gets across that she's far more understanding of a mother than you would expect. But certain things we learn a bit more about is Hunter. At this point, he's a big ball of nerves with everything going on. Something that haunts him is the fact that he's a Grimwalker. The what? Basically a clone of Bellos' brother meant to act as a substitute body for Bellos. He chooses to hide this fact from the group to the point it just creates so much stress. Thankfully, he gets some form of levity with the fact that he's considered family by Luke. This bringing happy tears to his eyes just how much he needed an actual friend group. It's giving a smidge of a follow-up on what Darius told him in Season 2, to actually be a teenager rather than some soldier blindly following orders. It's just great to get that follow through on this, but sadly it can't all go right for Hunter with the fact that with stress comes some mistakes. He doesn't even keep his wits about him when he goes touching some mysterious goop on the floor with an open cut. Come on man, it's just like, it's just unsanitary. Because this, Hunter ends up being possessed by Bellows, who was just that form of goop. It ends up leading to Bellows injuring Flapjack and then basically killing Hunter when he leaves his body, causing Flapjack to sacrifice himself to save Hunter. He was truly a good bird. This plays into how serious the situation has gotten. Now that they had the experience, the loss of their friends, giving them the true conviction they need to finally go and stop Bellows and save the Boiling Isles, taking us right into the next special. You guys mean the world to me and I, I didn't know how to say that yet. This is the goodest I felt in forever and ever. My biggest mistake was trying to protect you. I think I just realized something. The second special certainly had some criticisms hurled towards it mostly ranging from it seeming like it was fairly middle of the road, which it kinda is since, you know, it's the middle, but it does have some good revelations that keep things moving in some form. Now, one thing that I made clear in each video talking about this series is that it likes to do subversion. There's no exceptions here. For instance, you would think they would do the whole gang comes back to their home world and find it destroyed and there's a resistance mounted to fight back the tyrant, but here a group is formed by the students of Hexide, but they're mostly just hiding out mainly due to their leader's incompetence. Ugh. Allow me to introduce student body president Basha and her trusted guards Mickey and Roka. Welcome to New Hexide! Who? Who's Basha, you might ask, if you're new here? Well, she was the bully character in season one, but she ends up taking a backseat in the second season to the point that you forget she's there sometimes. So it's kind of a case that you might be surprised that she even returns at all and is made a big problem. It's one of the criticisms against the special. We spend time on this conflict with this character who was essentially a glorified jobber. She was just the means for Willow to overcome her bullies, which she did. So it feels a little weird to give her a prominent role here. Even weirder that Kikimura makes a return, taking on the role of the lackey to Basha. I don't think anyone wanted any more from this imp after everything that happened in the last season. Honestly, this all probably would have worked better if Basha and Kiki were given redemption arcs or more to do in general, but again, time is of the essence and the crew weren't given a full season, so you'll work with what you got, which still turned out pretty good for everyone else. 
For instance, we're given some time to Kang and the Collector. The Collector warped the entire Boiling Isles into some child's fantasy place that looks like candy and drugs had a baby, so basically edibles. This also results in people being turned into toys that the Collector plays with. It mainly takes effect when the Collector is present and goes away when he leaves the area, save for the toys which he takes back to his castle and just puts them in like a toy box. With the Collector doing this, it obviously is a problem, so King does his best to mediate the Collector a bit. King keeps the Collector somewhat subdued by playing a made-up game that retells the Owl House adventures he and Luz went on in a very fake way. It's all done in a way so the Collector doesn't go on some rampage destroying things because he got angry or just smashing things up just because he thinks it's fun. Cause again, lest we not forget, he basically is a god. But that is what's fascinating about him. They're just some kid who knows not what they do. All that power and all they really want is to not feel alone. It makes it a bit heartbreaking for them when you know they cling to King because King can relate to not having anyone in his dilemma. The Collector is just a little kid. A scary powerful one, but also sad and alone. I don't know. This whole time I was scared of making him mad, but I think I can relate to him. It's why you would be of the mind that the Collector isn't someone who needs to be destroyed or sealed away again, but rather someone who just needs a friend, even if his original purpose was to be a tyrant like his book alludes to. He's just a lost child. They could have easily been a villain that just needs to be stopped, but they went with a good nuanced approach that makes you sympathetic to their problems, but understanding that what they're doing is wrong. You even see that it takes manipulation for the Collector to want to cause harm with Bellow spreading misinformation to them. The special also gives an update on on what's going on with Ida. We find out that she managed to avoid being turned into a toy and is now missing an arm and her hair is shortened. Jeez, a lot did happen to her. Also, Lilith is okay and got a haircut and has her natural hair back. There's not much done or given to them here, but that's probably more safe for the finale. We do get a little more of the Owl Gang's personal problems though. Willow is seen as more of the rock of the group, even though she works with plants. Thank you, I'll be here all week. But enough shenanigans. Willow is the emotional support of the group, but what they do here is actually address the one question you would have about that. Who's the emotional support for the emotional support? She puts on a front pretending that everything is all good, but deep down she's scared. She wants to put on this facade for her friends because she knows they have their own struggles and she just wants to be strong for them and be there for them. But in the end, that only hurts her. We see this manifest with her powers going awry because she hid away her emotions. Thankfully, Hunter is there to calm her down and tell her that she can't just hold things in. This grew a bit from her wanting to see Hunter happy. Hunter is hurting because he lost Flapjack and won't admit that's what's bothering him by pushing through the mission. It all ends up hurting them, but they learn that hiding your feelings is never the right way to go. Willow and Hunter support each other through this roughness. Huh? Thanks for what you said back there. You mean a lot to me, too. Cool. Happy to help. I ship it. But now we come to Luz, who got a major revelation. For all this time we spent with her, we found out the problem that's been at the core of her was simple but very effective. Luz had struggles fitting in with many teenagers and just didn't know how to express herself in a way that wouldn't hurt others. She couldn't see eye to eye with her mother which caused a strain on their relationship. She lost her father and processed that by reading fantasy books that he gave to her and just clinging to that and only wanting that to be a part of her life. She couldn't find a friend group to call her own until she went to the Boiling Isles. And even and then it was a struggle for her to fit in that much, but she still had the friends she needed to find. What she goes through internally was something so many of us had faced when we were growing up. We learned this when Camila finally sits down with Luz and talks to her about how even she was an outcast when she was young. Revealing she was a nerd and wanted to escape to her fantasy books just as well. Luz understands this and has her biggest revelation. The only thing I've ever really wanted? Has to be understood. This is something that hits pretty hard. We all had the problem of wanting to find somebody who was like us or just gets what we're thinking a lot of the time. We even hope for that the most when it comes to our own parents. Cause let's face it, it always seemed like a given, but reality usually tells some of us otherwise. So for it to be Camila that perfectly gets this weird side of her daughter, it's a perfect sticking of the landing. This culminates in Luz getting her palisman that she named Stringbane. Of course, with knowing how accident prone Luz can be, that should put some fear in everyone. 
especially with how powerful it can be. Even making it so Luz has magic without limits. That's just terrifying. Why does that make me nervous? And now that most of that is squared away, the gang is ready to face off against the Collector. And it's time to get into the real meat and potatoes that is the finale. And here we are at the pinnacle of this series, the ending, the finale to it all. And it feels all too surreal that we're finally at the end point for this show. Just amazing. Wait, why are y'all looking at me like that? What do you mean my outfit changed? Y'all are crazy. For real though, this was the finale that brought everything to a head. Gives as many resolutions as it could from a series that sadly was cut short. And you know what? It may just be the finale for the ages. It throws the audience for a loop by having all of it start with the Owl Gang getting kidnapped and separated. Luz King and Ida are then thrown into these dream states where they're shown their worst fears. I said worst fears, not something that's gonna put them in a coma. Nah, they're shown their loved ones and Bill, for reasons, where they're being berated and chased. They go through this mental torture as a means to just keep them at bay. It's all done to set things up for something later as well as for the Collector to try and teach them some sort of lesson. With help of their friend's advice to use the light glyphs, Luz escapes and helps King and Ida wake up and they're finally reunited after so long. <laughs> Is this real? Is that Luz? Oh, are you both really here? Get over here, you witch! <gasps> <laughs> well, why are you crying? Oh no, man! <laughs> it's a truly good reunion that we've been waiting for, especially with how the episode plays out with it just being these three handling all the problems that's going to be facing them later. The Collector puts them through a series of challenges which also sows off their Pac-Man fever. Guess Pac-Man transcends dimensions. Who knew? But they give up fighting the gang, and it's here we learn about his backstory. You go down there and see if the Titans want to play! But the archivists were scared of their power. So one by one, they disappeared. Until there was one Titan left. He hid his egg from me and trapped me! Learning this about them makes everything all the more clear. They basically were just a victim of circumstance. They weren't just an apathetic child, they were locked away from people who would have taught them all the right things. Of course being trapped for so long messed them up, cause all they wanted was a friend and yet they got unwarranted hate because something their siblings did. It truly was just a case of they know not what they do. They share a lot in common with the Owl Gang with the fact that they were abandoned and misunderstood, which makes their turn towards good all the more reasonable which we have to address by addressing the big elephant in the room, Bellows. You suck! Bellows has been slipping his way through the boiling aisles like the slime that he is, trying to find a sustainable host. He worked his way into the Collector's palace and found Rain and possessed them. Then he worked that manipulative mouth of his on the Collector to sow doubt about King's friendship. The Collector lets it slip how powerful the Titan is and he's still alive. While the Collector is handling the Owl Gang, he goes off to the Titan's heart and takes it over. Finally, I can cleanse this plantation myself! Get the fuck out! <laughs> yeah, he goes on his last bastion against the demon realm, becoming this abomination that puts this coral stuff all over the place with his mouth beam. Gross. Now with this, the Collector takes it upon themselves to try to reason with him since he learned that being kind is better than forcing people to do what you want. It doesn't go well. You know, good effort, but yeah, Bellos is a psycho kid. That just wasn't gonna pan out for you. This results in Bellos shooting a beam at the Collector, but it gets intercepted by Luz. No, 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 no! Wait, 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 wait! Wait, 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 wait! Luz sacrifices herself, which plays into how she would do whatever to protect those she cares about. We saw this in season two's finale when she tried to do the same thing, but this time there was nothing stopping her. Because of this, she actually died. Man, these Disney shows really do love to kill their main characters. It's kind of a crazy trend that's been going on lately. 
Don't know why. But now we get absolute fury coming from King and Ida as they go full beast mode and try to destroy Bellos to no avail. It genuinely was gut wrenching to watch them just sit there in shock that their friend who they cared for and loved so much die in front of them. It really just speaks to how well it's animated. You just see all that heartbreak on their faces. It just hangs on them. Later we end up finding out Luz technically didn't die per se, but was sent to that in-between space from before. There she actually comes across King's dad, the original Titan. He reassures her that she is nothing like Bellos by bringing up a good point. Don't these feelings come from the same place? Well, you assume Bellos' goal comes from a genuine place, but that man doesn't care about anything but his need to be the hero in his own delusion. And because of that, he fears what he can't control. This makes it abundantly clear that Luz is nowhere near Bellos. He is a man who has too much sense of self-importance. He wants to control everything, which always results in nothing but destruction. It encapsulates why Bellos is a horrible person that deserves everything that's coming to him. The Titan then gives Luz some words of wisdom that's a spin on what Ida told her in the second season of the series, solidifying that you gotta make your own destiny. Nobody can tell you how it's supposed to go, and you can't wait around for it either. But Sadly, his spirit can't live on with Bellos corrupting his body, so he gives Luz his powers temporarily, and what follows is just unadulterated badassery. Luz ends up getting a Titan form, which just have to say, yes, queen. this allows her all the abilities of her glyphs and to be able to combine and just use a lot of very destructive magic to wreak havoc. Luz, Ida, and King team up and start wreaking havoc on Bellos all throughout the aisles. This is significant because it's just Luz, Ida, and King just like it was at the beginning of the show. This trio has been through so much and it feels like just a major release as they go through destroying Bellos, the man who caused so much of their problems. The entire sequence should be studied without much it's happening, from Luz finally doing magic without a glyph to all the animation popping off. It's just pure Sakuga type animation going through and it's amazing to watch. It's just pure spectacle. You cannot hate it. If you do, you just lost your dreams. Okay, you just did. I mean it, it's insane how they keep this looking so fluid throughout the whole fight. Just pure culmination of all those previous times where the animation was hitting extra hard, creating the most satisfying scene in the series. It ends with the Owl Trio defeating Bellos, where we get this moment of Bellos trying one last lie to save himself. Yes, I, I was I was cursed with a terrible, terrible sickness by by dark magic, just like your mentor. It forced me to do all those horrible things. But now I'm free. No, you lie! You lie! Yeah, he really tried that crap. Thankfully, we get the second most satisfying scene in the series. They made sure he got the ass whooping he deserved. Because, let's face it, he was an awful person who deserved exactly this type of death. With Bellos finally dead, peace is restored to the Boiling Isles. We get a final epilogue with the gang older and better places than before, with the final meetup of everyone at Luz's King Sinetta. Something that was always an idea for them to do, but we sadly couldn't get until now. It all plays like the perfect final note to a symphony. It's especially nice with the option they went with by giving Luz the best of both worlds. She gets to live in the human realm and visit the demon realm whenever she wants, and later on gets to live there entirely to attend college feels like the right approach for everything this series was building up to. You just have this feeling of gratification for all these characters and what they went through and were able to come out of it all the better. We got so much from them even though this show was cut short. The development all turned out great. It encapsulates the idea of prioritizing what you think is important for your story and characters and all the arcs you're trying to portray. It really is kind of a masterclass in doing that. It may have only been three years with this series, but you feel like it's been so much more because this show gave so much more. And that all comes from just how this series wanted to break so many conventions from the genre it participated in. Owl House is something that managed to go beyond. Thank you for that very unnecessary distraction. 
and went further than many would expect a Disney series to go. We've gotten plenty of shows that were able to shake things up for the most part, but Owl House feels like the one that took things to its proper apex. No other show on Disney was able to touch upon LGBTQ relationships like this show has. There were some that tried to push where they could, but this one gave us a proper case with Luz and Amity's relationship. They knew not to make anything hinge on this couple. We could have them just stay friends and it would change nothing in the story, but with them making it more personal problems for the characters, it allowed it the ability to develop properly. We get the ups and downs of Luz and Amity being together without petty drama. They're a great example of having romantic elements in your story without it feeling like it's just going nowhere or it's bloated or anything like that. Dana Terrence said herself that she didn't want a romance saga, and the way they're written, it shows. Their relationship feels genuine. It gives off that energy of two teenagers trying to figure out their relationship. No unnecessary drama or anything. We even avoid the unnecessary mess of having the will they won't they aspect. They get together fairly early on and we see the relationship actually play out whereas others would leave it as a happily ever after by the end. It plays out as an actual relationship and I think that's very important to actually see that for a lot of teenagers watching. Of course, it's not the smoothest, but they work past the problems through proper communication. And that's the heart of the problems that they face, communication, which translates as one of the major themes for this series, actually. Luz had problems expressing herself, which resulted in travesties against some people. Oh, that's where the backup snakes were. Seriously, people, snakes don't belong in schools. Just bear with me on this, please. For real though, Luz was someone who had the problem of just being misunderstood, and from watching the series you realize all that needed to happen with her is that she just needed someone to talk to her. Camila did drop the ball on this by not just sitting down and actually discussing things with her. If she had revealed earlier that she went through the same type of hardships that her daughter was going through, she could have avoided a lot of the problems Luz had in the school. This even applies to Ida, the owl lady. She kept things hidden from her own friends and family and all that did was cause more pain for both her and them. She lost Rain, the love of her life, all because she didn't want to be honest about her curse. If she just opened up, Rain could have potentially helped her through it. Maybe even helped her find a way to gain some control over it sooner. Probably could have gotten her hot form faster. It also serves as an allegory for chronic illness. I'm glad they didn't do anything in the end to cure her of this, because that's how chronic illness can be. It's not something that can just be so easily cured or anything like that. For many who have it, you just have to manage with it. But coming back to Luz, it stands to reason that she should have talked with Ida and her friends about what happened with Bellows. They would have given her the proper advice way sooner and eased her mind. It all comes down to being able to communicate with one another. This show went past its expectations on this fantasy genre, breaking from fan mindset and even the category itself. Loses a modern character in the fantasy genre that learns that escaping to your fantasy is not good for you. You gotta be able to face that reality you're going through. It's okay to want to escape, but running away is never the solution. But you don't have to face your reality alone. Even if you don't have your own friend group, you'll find one eventually. That's a lesson that stands at the core of Luz, that you'll find people who can understand you. She embodies finding your identity, but you don't have to find it right away. You're allowed to take your time. We see that with her. She struggles to know what is it she actually wants. Many series make sure the character finds themselves either early on, but this show made it a theme that lasts throughout to the end, giving Luz every kind of depth that you wouldn't expect, but you can easily relate to. The show breaks convention with Ida. She could have been the typical mentor that dies just to help the students resolve, but instead she has her own unique backstory. It actually is explored in full and we see the consequences of her trying to run from it. It works as a good lesson that it's better to face your past rather than run away from it. Luce and Ida are sort of two sides of the same coin. That's why it's so satisfying to see them alongside King beating down Bellows. How often do we get the mentor fighting alongside the student in the final battle, as well as sort of the mascot character? Speaking of which, Let's face it, we all thought King was going to be a simple sidekick mascot character, but he grew to break that mold. Usually mascot or sidekick characters are just your typical comic relief, but he proved to be different. He ended up having some level of complexity with him not knowing who he really was, finding out that he's actually a bigger piece in this whole entire puzzle. And you know what? It all works for him. We see his reaction to everything and it's what gets you behind him on figuring this all out. He's super sympathetic going past the preconceptions we had about him. This even applies to all the side characters, honestly. Lilith felt like she would just be the simple evil sister gone good, but she's just a pure being through and through. Seriously, her loyalty to the Emperor could have had her stay along with Bellos for a minute or have her work as a spy like they seem to be building towards, but instead we get her having to regrow her relationship with Ida and lose. 
making herself the cool aunt. A bad girl historian like myself is all about taking risks. So, let's boogie down to history town. Talented, brilliant, incredible, amazing, show-stopping, spectacular, never the same, totally unique, completely not ever been done before. AG Marvelous. She proves why she can work with the Owl Gang, making it clear that she should be there to help alongside them, that she was in the wrong place the whole time. And of course, how can you forget Hootie? Just a plain amalgamation of who did it and why. Honestly, you would think someone like him wouldn't be able to work in the series, that he'd be the one thing that drags the series down, but he's genuinely a very likable character that you can enjoy. Honestly, you would have thought he would have been more of the most useless characters, but it's like, no, he's actually a very pivotal character. He helped with the development of a lot of our main characters. He's the one who got Lumity together. He's the one who helped Ida realize she can actually work with her curse and got King to realize there's more to him than he actually knew. Honestly, it's just amazing how he turned out so well and just ended up being a massive subversion of a sidekick character. Though I'll admit, I'm still curious as to what exactly he is. That's just the one thing that's going to haunt me for a while because I just need to know what is he? You also have the friends who all have their own personal problems going on that help flesh them out outside of the main conflict. Willow struggles to prove that she's worth something. She ends up showing that she actually is possibly one of the strongest of the group. Gus doubts his own abilities and needs the support of his friends showcasing how you can't get into your own head. It's honestly amazing how they showcase that. Hunter was played into that Zuko type, but easily comes into his own as a character with how he faces his betrayal from Bello. Not to mention his connections he's able to make with the Owl Gang. And then there's Amity. She could have been a simple love interest with not much going on and always just being based around what the main character's doing, but you know how this show do. She became an example of how to do a love interest, having her own problems dealing with them and finding herself and breaking away from her corrupt mother. She had that sour attitude of thinking she's better than others, but actually grew to be better than who she was, which speaks even more to how strong the romantic angle of this series is. Of course, you also gotta think about the side characters that all pop in and leave a very strong impression. Everybody loves V. Ida and Lilith's mom leaves a good impression and easily adds some depth to what's going on with their backstory. All these minor characters from Principal Bump to Matholomew to Basha to the twins and everyone else, they just add way more to this world. It makes it very clear that it's like, yeah, there are very much problems and dilemmas that these characters are going to go through and they're going to be fleshed out using these side characters as well. Then the collector who comes in later in the series turns out to be a perfect case of someone who knows not what they do. They didn't know about the concept of death and just thought they were having playtime with everybody. Even King caught on to this and understood they didn't need to be killed or anything, they just needed a friend to show them right from wrong. With how they are, they play the role of someone who is redeemable because all they needed was love and compassion. They were just ignorant of the world around them, which plays to the opposite of Bellows who was just plain stupid. Speaking of which, of course you gotta talk about the villains, particularly the one. Bellos was an evil mother that made it clear he should definitely be taken seriously. From the way he went manipulating everyone to playing the long game in his horrific scheme, a pure bigoted jackass that gains no sympathy. Even in his final moments, he couldn't let his hatred go. It just shows that racism is an ugly thing that needs to be snuffed out because all the pain and suffering it can cause. It usually ends up creating very fascist regimes that just cause a lot of harm and kill innocent people. And obviously, with the way Bellos was running his empire, that was just what he was planning to do. Especially with his plan, it was just to commit genocide. And seeing how this show played everything out, you see exactly why bigotry cannot stand and why it cannot be allowed to bloom. There's honestly a fine line between being ignorant and being stupid. He's stupid because he knows what he's doing is wrong, but he doesn't care. He's just stuck in his own delusion. A thing I would like to think about Bellos is that even when knowing what happened to him, he is still not supposed to be a tragic villain. He killed his own brother because of his bigoted mindset. He caused all the problems the Boiling Isles ended up facing based on his hatred for a group of people that really didn't do anything to him. They were just living their lives. He deserved everything bad that happened to him but that's what makes him a good villain. He's a villain that leaves a strong impression because of how he holds a mirror 
up to people who can't change, a monster through and through that has to be snuffed out, especially with its straight up creep factor. Speaking of which, the look of this series is something that definitely won't be forgotten. The dynamic look and feel of the Boiling Isles makes it a place you want to know more about. That mix of horror elements creates such an odd and eccentric creatures that probably haunt your nightmares. You're no chosen one. I think I just myself. This is certainly gonna go down as one of Disney's best looking shows. I can guarantee you that. But this show goes beyond all the elements it utilizes. The fandom has got to be one of Disney's most passionate in a minute. Sure, they are uh, a bit questionable on certain aspects, but that's neither here nor there. We're not getting into that. The many cosplays you see, the fan edits, theories, all of it. They show a deep connection to the show because of how it carried itself and who it was able to speak to. Not to mention a few people who were fans of the series who went on to actually work on the show. Many flocked to it because of the central message of finding your own friend group and finding yourself. It spoke to so many people in a genuine manner. But don't just take my word for it. The Owl House is a pretty special show for me. I have been pretty much obsessed with the show for the last three quarters of a year. Doesn't sound like a lot of time since I know it started almost three years ago. I'm totally key in on that word. Obsessed. I don't think a day has really gone by since King's Tide that I haven't thought about this show in some capacity. I get the feeling it's one of those shows I'm always going to remember and come back to. This is this is the something I'll actually get nostalgia for. And if anyone who ever, ever actually worked on the show comes across this thank you so 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 much for what you've done i love this and i am so happy you decided to make this show or work on it or do anything in relation to it it's amazing hello there this is emily i just wanted to say um a big thank you to the owl house and their crew dana the storyboarders designers and everyone that works um, on the show especially the animators overseas i'm really glad you guys all managed to get your credits uh at the end at the very very end but at the end everyone individually named <clears throat> and um i would just like to say thank you to the show who helped me carry me through a pandemic who carried me through a year of living in the shelter a year of just going through the craziest parts of my life as i left my household and became an independent person and now live in my own house and uh, i even managed to travel to mexico to go and see somebody that i had met through the love Lao house so i'm so happy and just so thankful so thank you thank you very much Hello, my name is Chris Richards, and I'm a fan of the of the Disney Channel animated series The Owl House, and and I just want to say I am going to miss this amazing show on Disney Channel. I wish it was never canceled. I wish there was more adventures for Luz, Eden, and King, and all their friends. And um, I just want to thank <coughs> Dana Terrace. I want to thank Dana Terrace and her crew and her cast for making this amazing and wonderful show. And I you hope know, you guys help me. Great success in the future, make more cartoons. What I really love about this show is that it's, uh, it's the, the characters, the story, the world building, especially its diversity with its you know, divergent and LGBT representation. For me personally, I'm autistic and and I can relate to characters, especially the two main characters, Luz and Ida, because they're very wonderful and heartwarming. Across how much this show has helped me, and I am thankful for it just existing. The Owl House is my favorite show I've ever watched, my biggest interest in anything ever. Besides it just being an amazing show, it's helped me a lot in real life. It was one of the few things that made helped me get through COVID and still really helps today. It was the reason I made real friends for, friends for the first time in like four to five years. And it get me closer with my mom. It also helped me realize I could be neurodivergent. This show also is the reason I came out to my friends and family. And it's the first time I saw such amazing LGBTQ plus representation in media. Specifically for kids, I cannot put into words how much I love and adore this show. It would be impossible. But I hope I can at least show part of my love for the show in the video. This show has been a wild journey and I am so grateful for it. I love everything about the show from the characters, the plot, the animation, voice acting, etc. Thank you, Dana, and thank you to the crew and everyone who's working the show. And thank you, Owl House. You were 
an amazing show that's helped me and many others, including people I know. I will miss you, but I'm so grateful and thankful that you have been here. Thank you to the Owl House. Thank you, Dana. Thank you to the crew for this wonderful show. So, as this is a thank you to the crew, I thought it um, best to <laughs> um, be in my Owl House gear. And um, I just wanted to say thank you to the crew and thank you to everyone who's worked on the show. It means the world to me. Like, I'm so happy this show exists. And I'm so grateful for the representation that's in the show that allows me to, like, be seen in the show. And also, um, you know, it's just a great show! I first heard about The Owl House back in 2019 when I first started watching Amphibia, so I kept up to date with it ever since. And then the first episode finally aired and I was absolutely in love with it. And I've been watching the show ever since. This has been one of my favorite shows for the past three years, and to see it end is just a bit weird, but hey, nothing lasts forever. Too bad Disney cut it short, but hey, at least, at least we got it all, and that's what really matters in the end. So yeah, I just want to give a big thanks to Dana and the crew for making the show possible in the first place. To close off with wise words and voice critical, that's about it. See ya. When I first started watching The Owl House, I was 11, now I'm 16, and I still love the show. It is the best show to come out since Gravity Falls. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you to Dana Terrace and anybody who worked on The Owl House. And even though Disney canceled it, thank you for even giving it a chance. It's really hard to have to say goodbye to The Owl House after being such a huge part in my life for such a long time, saying goodbye isn't easy. But as cheesy as it sounds, the memories will be there forever. I have so much gratitude for this show, for this crew, and for this community. Every time I came across a new theory, a piece of fan art, a new secret detail nobody's found before, my face would just light up with glee. So thank you all to each and every last member of the crew for creating such a stellar show with such lovely and memorable characters and for making such a positive impact in the lives of so many people. And with that, I guess all that's left to say is, bye! Hey there, um, I just wanna say that um, The Owl House has been a show that I've watched since 2020, and it has dug deep into my heart as one of my favorite, and it is also the reason why I'm bisexual. Well, made me realize that along with Steven Universe, but yeah, that's basically what I have what I have. I also have, I have to say this, thank you Dana Terrence, thank you everybody uh, who worked on the show from the storyboard artists to the executive producers, production associates, animators, you all rock, you all deserve a nice relaxing break. It is much needed because you guys work so hard into making this show magnificent. So thank you all. We love you. Have a great day. Bye. When Thanks to Them came out, a friend of mine who is 27 and uh, non-binary uh, talked to me about this episode and they said that they wish they had this show when they were a teenager. So thank you, Owl House. Thank you for giving a voice to so many people who were previously clamoring for this kind of show. Thank you so much for inspiring so many people, young and old, and giving them a chance to actually see themselves. Thank you so much, Dana Terriers, for creating the show, the, um, the owl crew, and the characters that they created. This show um, filled a special place in my heart, and I'm gonna miss it when it ends. And to all the misfits out there, the misunderstood, and the weirdos, we stick together. The Owl House is a production that was never afraid to be bold and adventurous. It's a brave endeavor from start to finish, and the recognition that its fans give it is nothing to laugh at. Despite its truncated run, The Owl House managed to tell a story that was full of thrills, chills, wit, imagination, and vulnerability. Luce, Ida, King, and the rest of this colorful cast will always have a place in my heart. And while I hate to see it go, I'm happy that I got to spend this time with it. Thank you to Dana Terrace, thank you to the marvelous crew that made this show happen, 
You guys are the best. I have endless appreciation for you. This show means so much to me and to, me, to many other people. I can't describe in the perfect words how much this show has helped me get by like these last few years. And just seeing where it started to now being here to witness it finally being over, it it's surreal. So many characters having all of these relatable moments just told in such a beautiful story. Seeing Luce and how much of her and the rest of these other characters just have all grown on this journey, it just brings me so much happiness. I only hope that more people who have not watched the show yet get on it immediately because they are really missing out. I just wanna say thank you so much. Thank you to Dana Terrace and the Owl House crew for what you have given us. I just hope you all can continue to thrive in the future on your on future adventures on whatever it is you all plan to do from here on out i'm wishing you all nothing but success thank you again so much i just wanted to say thank you to the owl house it was like tr and thank you to the crew it was like a truly magical show when like which every episode was like an event and like all the theories and all the representation and like all the things will always be will, will always have a special place in my heart Seriously, no cartoon can do it like this one. So much work gets put into animation. Stuff we do know, don't know. And as we grow older, get more appreciative the more we do learn about animation. And Owl House is definitely one of those shows for me, like many others, that will stay in my head for it because it's so fantastic. The magic effects, the animations, the character designs, everything that went into this show. The hard work, the dedication, the blood, sweat, and tears to get us these many quality characters and their stories, whether they were told or untold. I would like to thank the entire Owl House crew for giving that to us. Because it's just going to stay in our heads for years, older and the younger generations. Thank you, Owl House crew. We appreciate you and all the hard work you've done. Thank you, Dana Terrence, and thank you, the amazing Owl House animation crew. You guys have made such a big impact on so many people's lives, and you've just done so much amazing things with representation and just everything. We just want to say thank you, and these years have been so amazing, and <sighs> the Owl House may be ending, but it's never gone. It's made such a big impact that it's just so amazing. Thank you guys. Hey everybody, Julian here. I am a story of artist, writer, uh, dealt in a bit of voiceover. I have been a fan of Dana Terrace's work since 2015, before the show even got announced. And as soon as the show got announced, I knew it was in for a treat. I've loved every bit of it from the story, the characters, the lore, the worlds, the fantasy stuff. I'm a huge sucker for fantasy uh, stories, especially like if they have creatures or animals. Bonus points that they also incorporate like horror supernatural elements into it, there too. Um, the crew crafted such a wonderful like show from the writers, directors, and story bars. Special shout out to the voice cast as well, especially my boy Zeno Robinson. So love you dude. You are absolutely phenomenal. This is your best performance ever. Um, Little sound in the show got shortened a bit, but for what we got, they still made a wonderfully crafted show, uh, and I'm gonna miss it so much. I would love to get to work on shows like this someday. Uh, so again, thank you to Dana, the cast and the crew for making such a wonderful show. Thank you to the Owl House team for creating such a wonderful show. We're really gonna miss it. Hello, my name is Nick Everly from Pablo, Ohio, and I just wanna say thank you to the entire Owl House crew to Data Terrence, to Rebecca Rose, to Sissy Jones, and to everybody who has worked on the show. It means a lot to me, especially for someone who is autistic. And I feel represented by Luz Nostata, and I really love everything about the show, from the from the characters, to the atmosphere, to the lore, and the secrets. And I feel like there's a, there's a lot more world to explore. And I'm sad that the show is gonna go, but I still am grateful that it exists. And I hope Dana Terrence, whatever is the next chapter in her life, that she gets the opportunity to make a comic series, whether it be a prequel, a sequel, or even some scenes that has never gone to the TV screen. But other than that, thank you, everyone. I love you, and 
I'm just gonna end this here. Okay, bye! Hey everyone, Justin here. Just wanted to take a minute to uh, give my thanks to the Owl House and everything the show has meant to me over the past three years that it's been airing. It got me through some very hard times, especially during the pandemic. Uh, it's just been a joy watching this show grow and just get better and better with every episode, every season, just the amount of heart, the representation the show has to offer, it's, its writing, its characters, their development, following Luce, King, Ida, Willow, Hunter, everyone else has just been amazing. And I can't thank, you know, Dana, Terrence, and everyone who was involved in making this masterpiece of a cartoon um, for their hard work. So I'm going to miss it. I really wish you could stick around for more longer than this. But thank you, The Owl House, just for everything you've done for me. The Owl House is a modern classic. Incredible animation, voice acting, storytelling, character writing, and direction overall throughout the entirety of its run. And I personally think the show ended off with a massive masterpiece bombshell that will go down in history as one of the best endings ever. Make sure to push the agenda to put this show onto other people as soon as you can. Thank you, Dana, and the entire Owl House crew for making this show one of the best shows I've personally ever seen. And although the adventure is over, I can't wait to rewatch it down the line with other people and convince them to enjoy this story as much as I and many other people have. Once again, from the bottom of my heart, that sounds strange because of what happened in the episode, but with that being said, thank you, genuinely. And Dana and the crew, I would like to thank you for putting all you can in these final three episodes. I know it's not a lot to work with, but you still did it somehow. And the first two episodes, they were they were amazing. And honestly, they could be one of my favorites. I love the originals though, obviously. And I'm sure episode three will not disappoint. I'm really excited to see it. And I would just like to thank you for everything you put into the show. It's brought joy to a number of people, including me, and it's changed a lot of our lives. So overall, thank you for everything you've done for the Owl House. Thanks, Owl House, for being such an amazing show. I thought you were just going to be another amphibic clone, but you drew me wrong and gave me one of the best TV ones you have ever had. So, thanks, Dana Terrace and everyone else, and I hope you go on to make even more great products than this one. That Owl House finale, right? Anyway, what you see now is my remade art of Luz that I made back in 2018 that I made last year. Anyway, shout out to the Owl House crew for do using what they had left at the time they had to craft this finale. It was a pretty good watch and pretty memorable at it, one at that. Anyway, shout out to the crew, the writers, the artists, everyone who made this show special. This is for you. See ya. Peace. Heyo, Tune for Thought here. The Owl House is a show that, from the start, has gripped me to heights few others have matched. From the unique yet easy to follow magic system, to the large assortment of comfort characters that were a blast just to follow, to the gripping escalation of the larger plot that by a point kept the show in my brain about every single day. And of course, the pure inclusivity of it all. Witnessing everyone who felt seen and rewarded by it, just such a sight to behold, man. Especially for fellow neurodivergents like myself. And the only real disappointment is that we didn't get more of it all. But that's neither here nor there. So for that, I'd like to say thank you, Dana Terrace, for delivering an experience unlike any other. And may you see greater success in your future. What is the Owl House? Wow. Uh, how existential are we getting here? Um, the Owl House is a place where everybody is welcome. It's a place where you can come if you are in the middle of your redemption arc. It's a place where you can come if you are new to town and uh, not familiar with the way things are. And it's a place where you can come if you're just a weirdo and you have no other place to fit in. But regardless of who you are, it's home and uh, it's a big fluffy bird worm wrapping you in a giant hug. That is the Owl House. I would say it's a sanctuary for the weirdos. And it became, it started as a sanctuary and I think it became a home.
that's how I feel about it. I think the Owl House is definitely about like, just like people who don't feel seen or understood. It's like their space. And like, I've like, it's so cool to see like so many people resonate with like the show and like be like, yeah, I've, I've never felt such representation in my life. And it's like, wow, it's amazing. Like, I, like I'm so, like I'm happy for you because like, I, I understand what it's like to not feel seen. Like, I feel like we all have no, everyone knows what it's like to not feel seen. And I think like the Owl House just does such a, an amazing job at letting people know that you can find your family and there is a place for you somewhere. Um, like, it, like you are worthy of love and you are worthy of being a part of something, you know, or you belong anywhere you want to belong. It's just like finding your people. Like, I think that's like the biggest thing. Um, I think that reflects in the show itself and just this crew. Um, you know, us weirdos gotta stick together. <laughs> I started this series back in the very first episode that was released in 2020. Literally was my first review video for that year. Since then, it has gone on to be one of my all-time favorite series, period. I put a lot into showing love to the show, be it including awesome clips of it and AMVs I make or video series I made on it. I started this video series as a means to show how this was not some typically animated show. I wanted it to be known that this series was different, that these characters are different, that this story is different. I want to believe I was able to do that, honestly. I have a love and care for shows that have come and gone, but this one spoke to me in a different way. I have a deep appreciation for those that can come and break the mold. This show spoke on so many things that are real to a lot of us. Be you LGBTQ or someone with chronic illness or someone who just wants to be understood by your friends and family. It spoke to finding your true identity and being true to yourself no matter what. And that spoke to something in me. I always want to see people be allowed to express who they are no matter what. I don't like it when I see others just being put down for being who they are, especially if what they're doing and who they are doesn't really conflict with anybody else and they're just minding their own business. This show was the epitome of fighting against conformity and more. Sure we can be mad that it got cut short, we can be mad that there are certain threads that we wish could have been explored more, but when it came down to it, the crew stuck to what was most important for the main characters and the story. They prioritized the heart of what makes this series so special. That's a level of storytelling that deserves all the flowers. The Owl House was something that started a movement for so many fans. It connected to them on a deep and personal level. It made many feel seen. That power that this series is able to have is something I have the utmost admiration for. It is an exemplary series that is definitely gonna withstand the test of time. It's not just a thought when I say, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you so, so, so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. To be a part of something that makes a positive impact in people's lives is just so special and you know we're appreciative to be a part of it whatever people give to us we give back because it's just such a, a fun project to to be a part of an experience when i was watching steve universe when i was 15 16 whatever like i hope that's the same feeling that they're feeling um like seen and heard and like appreciated like because we do appreciate like the fans Thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for ma making the merch. 
the fan merch as well. Thanks for the fan art. Thanks for the engagement. And like, thanks for making it trend on Twitter like every week. <laughs> Thank you for telling your friends. Thank you for being so excited about it. And yeah. Okay, everyone, on the count of three. One, two, three. Bye. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.